Hello and welcome to episode number 319 of the Armin Show podcast, where we have been learning more in a variety of categories. On this one, we have the author of the book, You Have More Influence Than You Think, and the tagline, How We Underestimate Our Power of Persuasion and Why It Matters. Dr. and Professor Vanessa Bones, let me tell you about her a little bit. She is an associate professor at the Department of Organizational Behavior, and she at Cornell. And she received her PhD in social psychology from Columbia and her AB in psychology from Brown University. Her research focuses on social influence and psychology of compliance and consent. Vanessa, glad to have you on the show. Happy to be here. Thank you. This is a great thing. I like influence the topic of it. Can we make a difference? Some of us can make a huge difference. And it's good to know the ways we are able to do so your book has a nice additive feature. It makes the person think that maybe there's more that I'm doing currently than I even think I'm doing, which then you show us is the case, which is nice because it builds up um, almost self-esteem or whatnot for individuals who are trying to cause influence. Why the category of influence? Do you, was there a person you saw that was very influential that you read into, or do you like to know how things are happening externally? Um, I mean, I feel like I kind of stumbled into the domain of influence um, when I was a graduate student. I think, you know, a lot of us, some people come into grad school with a very clear idea of what they want to study, but I think a lot of us come in and try a bunch of things and have an idea of what we want to study and then stumble on something that, you know, is more powerful than we expected or just, you know, moves us more than we expected. And so that's kind of the case with me. So you know, I had a bunch of different ideas about what I might study. And then I was working with Frank Flynn at Columbia and we, you know, I was collecting data for a survey study we were doing. Um, and I discovered that people were more likely to say yes to me when I was collecting this data than I had ever expected. Um, and Frank had some intuitions that maybe that was a broader phenomenon. And so we worked together to see if that was sort of a more universal finding and it wasn't just sort of specific to me and so we started running studies where we had people ask other people for things and found that they were kind of surprised by the influence they had um, and so I studied that for you know over 15 years now that kind of basic phenomenon and then over the past maybe five years I started to see these bits and pieces in other areas that were kind of similar that where people were kind of underestimating their influence in other types of ways, not just with asking, which was typically the case in my studies. Um, and so it became sort of a broader idea about, wait a minute, maybe there is something bigger here about influence. It's not just about asking for things, not just about, you know, compliance, um, but also about all these other things, like the things that we say to people and whether they kind of, you know, stick in people's heads more than we realize and things like that. Right. Now, as far as the unseen influence, how much of it is that things that we are just getting because we are just a person and people give us a chance because we're a person? Or are these related to qualities we're bringing that we're not noticing? So I do think that a lot of it, so the unseen influence, I imagine you're talking specifically about sort of the times that people are paying attention to us that we might not realize. Yes. Um, and so that's, that comes mostly from Erica Boothby's work on the invisibility cloak, mm -hmm. where we think that, you know, other people aren't sort of paying attention to us as much as they actually are. And like, we're walking through the world in this invisibility cloak and yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, I definitely think there's an element of it's because we're people, because we are wired, you know, to notice the people in our environment. Um, there's plenty of theories that suggest that, you know, people's physical presence is important. Um, but then on the other hand, there's these kind of comparable findings in the world of mediated communication. For example, there's the invisible audience effect as well, which is basically when we post something on social media, you know, we judge how many people see our posts based on likes and engagement and things like that. But because of that, we tend to underestimate how many people are actually seeing our posts. And so there's this kind of invisible audience out there that's much bigger than we expect. 
um, I think the statistic is like it's three times more people than we expect are actually seeing the things we post. And so as much as I do think a lot of these phenomena that I talk about in the book are because we're human and, you know, near other people, and that is a big part of it, there seems to also be this element that's, that can show up in these mediated contexts as well. Invisible audience is a thing I have felt for many years, and sometimes it's confirmed to me by people who tell me, I didn't know they were checking my stuff. Suddenly they're like, yeah, I screenshot some of your quotes that you post or message. I'm like, I didn't know that. Or that thing you posted last week, you took it down too quickly. I, I would have wanted a copy. I'm like, oh, you didn't say anything. So <laughs> there's a lot happening in the background that is not mentioned. There's so much unsaid. I always think about the unsaid yeah. because I find out a year later, two years later, three years later. So on that concept, how can someone bring more of the unsaid into the said or into their world so that there's not this like lost, lost entity? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I think that, I mean, my first sort of reaction is that that's one of sort of the key factors of why we underestimate our influence is because we base our sort of ideas about when we're influencing people on what is said, right? But so much goes unsaid. So, you know, we think if we've convinced someone of a position that they're going to tell us right there, like, oh, that's a really good point. Now I've changed my mind, you know, right. <laughs> or like if they really liked something that we posted on social media that they're going to click like, you know, right. but lots of times we think, oh, that was funny. And we don't engage or, you know, someone makes a compelling case and either we don't want to tell them that we're convinced right then, or it takes time to really turn around and be like, okay, I get what that person was saying like a week ago, you know? Um, and so I don't know if there really is a way to get that kind of engagement, uh, you know, in a different way, sort of to solicit people to tell us those things. Cause so much of influence is unsaid and subtle and delayed. Um, so I think it's less about necessarily getting that to come to the front more, because I think that might be unrealistic. I think it's more about being mindful that influence doesn't always look the way we think it does, you know? And so understanding that just because someone didn't engage or didn't immediately, you know, change their behavior in front of your very eyes or tell you, you know, they're won over by your argument. That doesn't mean that you are having, you, you're not having an impact. And so I think part of it is sort of reframing what influence means to ourselves. This is a great point and actually gets across the bigger concept. It's not so much about direct, this leads to that result which is kind of punchy in a way. It's not really taking the other person into account. Maybe they would like a lighter form of what we're bringing to the table, 10% of it, 20% of it. Maybe it adjusts them in a certain direction two years later. We don't need to have the exact outcome. That's never great. And then like one time Tupac said, let's not be so selfish that we have to change the world, but maybe we uh, influence the person to change the world in some way. We just do our part, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, what is a way that should an influencer of today take into account? Can anyone take into account the unsaid influence or it's just something in the back burner and know that it's there and know that you're having more of an impact than you are thinking? Yeah, I mean, so I think that there's kind of a few answers to that. So one is that I, so sometimes I say like, we need to do like an influence audit. Um, so basically like check in with yourself and uh, see all the ways in which you are influenced by people that they might not know, you know, the times that people have made a good point that you haven't told them um, and kind of become more mindful of how that could be the case in the other direction as well. Um, but then, you know, one thing I talk about in the book is this distinction between taking perspective and getting perspective, um, which Nick Epley and his colleagues have talked about. And so that's really, you know, as you said, trying to get that unsaid information to be said to some extent. I don't think that's always possible, but when it is possible, you want to hear it from the other person as opposed to kind of guessing what your impact was on the other person. And so they talk about, you know, when people are instructed to sort of take someone's perspective, they basically search their own minds for what they think the other person is reacting to or feeling in the moment. 
Um, and that can be wrong, right? We have our own ideas about what someone else is like that could be wrong. We have stereotypes about what people are like that could be wrong. And so we could make, you know, these mistaken sort of assumptions about how we've affected somebody else. Um, and they talk about the best way to find out how you have affected someone, or they don't really put it in terms of influence, but the best way to find out what's going on in someone's head is to actually get perspective. And that means asking them, you know, after I said this, like, how did you feel? Um, what did you think of this? Maybe going back to someone a week later, I just wondered after that conversation we had, had, you know, what you were thinking about that. So I don't think that's always going to be the case um, that we have that opportunity. But when we do, we want to try to actually get out of our own heads and hear from someone else's, you know, uh, mind what they're saying. Right. There's a difference between like being on stage and there's the audience and then taking into account what it feels like in the audience, which you can't do when you're on stage. But we can only use the times when we have been in the audience as an example or uh, reach out and get feedback from people in the audience after the fact. And what did you think? Or did I cause this feeling or whatnot? You talked about that actually in the book, The Power of Being in the Audience. Uh, is it more valuable to be in the audience? Should we have no people on the stage anymore? <laughs> that's a good question. That's good. That's the extreme, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mostly talk about because we assume like there's this default assumption that the person on the stage is the person with all the influence. Um, and I go through some examples where that's really clearly not the case, right? So for example, like comedians who are working out uh, their bits in front of an audience, you know, they often talk about the fact that, you know, the audience is really deciding what they keep and what they throw out of their material. Like they're not even in control of the show. Like the audience is very much in control of the show. Um, and politicians do the same thing. So one of the things I talk about is like, you know, you've got the Trump rallies where he says something and he very, you can see it visibly, like the way he responds to how the audience responds, right? Like if they like something, he goes with it. If they don't like something, you know, he backtracks. Um, and so this kind of audience tuning and sort of shaping your own message to how the audience is reacting, it happens all the time. And what that means is that just by virtue of being in front of the stage, holding a microphone, you know, you're not the only one with the influence. You're not sort of just putting the information out there for other people to absorb, but instead the audience is shaping even the messages that they're getting exposed to. And to some extent, because of things like the saying is believing effect, once you say something and then the audience clearly agrees with that, that solidifies it in your own mind. And you're like, okay, oh wow, they went for that. Like that must really be true. And so there's this back and forth where it's, you're really, even the speaker is being shaped and their opinions are being shaped by the audience's reactions to things. Um, so I think it's not that there's no need for the speaker or that you know the audience has more influence necessarily, but I definitely think this idea that it's a one-sided kind of influence is untrue. Yes, you made me think about two things there. One, I've done open mic comedy a few times and when I did it, uh, I just kind of go like a train and then uh, but over a few times of doing it, then I, took more into account from the audience and I do a lot of stuff for feedback because I just go and that's my forte. So we all have different forte. If mine is just, I just go and then getting feedback along the way, whether it's light or if I don't notice it for a while, it shows up louder at some point. It's like, you need to do this. So uh, it's like a touching evolution sort of. I, I once met Gary Vaynerchuk that you just reminded me of it. And he, I asked him a question. I said, do you do what you do to interact with a lot of people because it's like you're touching the market, touching evolution in a way. And um, I feel like that's what he does with, or anybody who's prolific, they're always uh, getting little bits of feedback here and there. And you can't compete with somebody who is prolific in that nature in the same way that you have studied this category for over a decade and a half, let's say 15 years. So you become prolific in something and then you're almost untouchable at that point in that field. Uh, how has feedback made a big difference for you in your uh, writing process? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. You know, um, so I was on the podcast Getting to Yes, or I'm sorry, Yes And, Second City's Yes And, not Getting to Yes. Improv. Um, improv, yeah. 
And so this is why I'm thinking of it. I want to give them credit because I hadn't thought about this before in this way, but they asked you at the end of the podcast, like give an example of a time that you said yes and, and it was important, right? It changed like your perspective or your professional career, whatever it is. Um, And when I was thinking about it, the thing that really came to mind is writing and, you know, especially like with book writing, but also with academic writing, you know, you submit journal articles and you get this feedback. And over the years, I've worked with so many different people who react to this feedback in so many different ways, right? So some people, and I think we all have a gut reaction when someone criticizes our work, you know, many of us at least have a gut reaction of like, you know, they're wrong, right? Um, And so I would see people really run with that. Yeah, exactly. You just don't get it. Um, And so, you know, I've worked with people who really run with that, or at least seen people do that and just like kind of dismiss the reviewers and, you know, maybe say something to sort of assuage them or something, but like not really go with it. And then I've seen other people who kind of just totally cow to the reviewers and they're just like, you know, okay, we're just going to do everything because we got to get the sense. So we're going to do it all. And um, I think some of the, I think I'm trying to remember who exactly, because I'd like to give credit, but I can't remember who it was in my career, who was basically just like, okay, anytime a reviewer says something, they're responding to something legitimate, right? They're having this reaction that other people are likely to have as well. And so you have to kind of say yes to that. And they didn't use these words, but this is where like the yes and comes from. You have to be like, yes, you are responding to something legitimate. Like your reaction to this is legitimate in some realm. That doesn't mean I have to necessarily go with it, but I do have to address that you're having this reaction. So yes, and this is what I'm going to do with it, right? Like, and I'm going to fix it in this way, either in the way you said or in some other way, but I am going to sort of take that seriously. And so I think that has really shaped my writing. It, It helped me when I was writing the book, because every time my editor would say something, I just knew I start with yes, like you were having a a genuine, like reaction that I should take seriously. I didn't always agree with it. I didn't always make the change, but I, I engaged with it in some way. And more often than not, I did wind up making the change, you know? And so I think it just makes it easier. It's less defensive. Um, and in the end, I just think it's made my work so much better to just be like, these are legitimate concerns. Any reaction is legitimate. Uh, and if I disagree with it, I just have to convince myself why. And that's like where the and is. It's nice to get a sense that, well, for that person that they're being listened to and they would probably understand too that there's their random commentary shouldn't suddenly adjust someone else's life completely into a different mm-hmm. direction. So I think they would see it on their end. When I think about reviews, I have all these, uh, I think of like rappers a lot, but Jay-Z was talking about reviews of one of his albums and he said people would leave a review after like two hours after the album was up. He said, well, I can't take it too seriously because he barely gave it time. So it's like a, attaching a certain weight to reviews based on the person taking into account your material or uh, how much they relate with it. It's like an adjustment of giving it some credit, but not over crediting it. So it limits you. I, that's one of my actual rules that I would give something credit, but never to the point that like now I'm stopping. Mm-hmm. That just cancels any sort of future effort. Like, okay, this is a good point. I better quit yeah. Off I go to, to depart in some sort. I look at a lot of quotes from uh, different individuals of sorts in the specific category of this. Cause I always like to make it uh, current. You're clearly going to get a lot of um, feedback at the current moment with your book being out. And do you take into account heavily all the feedback along the way? And how much does it, how much do you see the extended levels of influence you're having currently? Um, I mean, I definitely, I have gotten some feedback and sometimes I'm like, oh, I wish I had said that differently, you know, for this, that reason in that book or more often it's like, you know, here's some research that is related to the book. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had been able to include that in the book. And so mostly what I've done is try to bring that up, you know, in interviews, for example, or, you know, even uh, I wrote a piece after the book came out that was like, here's some work I wish I had put in the book. (laughs) Um, Because I really, I really genuinely did wish that. Um, And yeah, I mean, the fun part I'd say has been really seeing that people did read it, even like, 
So you said, you know, Jay-Z was like, you, I can't take you seriously two hours after, you know, the album comes out. Fair right. enough. But I had, you know, for example, a couple of people email me the day the book came out, like that evening. And they said, like, I couldn't stop reading it. I read it all day um, and then had this wonderful feedback. And it would just like felt amazing to think that people are actually on the other end reading this now um, and that, you know, they're benefiting from it in some way. Right. That's a good point. Actually, when he described that one, the person had commented that like this album is a classic and that's kind of hard to do right away. Maybe give it a week before it's called like a timeless classic. Yeah, <laughs> but that's true. It's nice when someone I think a lot of the I picture it like a graph of energy, right? As something occurs, it's like here and then it kind of dwindles down and there's like a long tail over time. And then mm -hmm. there's so much that happens at an early point And we as people are barely able to keep up usually with all that. And there's things we miss at that part. But that's the like punctuated equilibrium of our existence. Bigger, bigger picture concepts there. Actually, on that one. <laughs> I always like to go back to, I didn't include it there. What are uh, three elements of your personality that lead to uh, what you do or getting into this category? Oh, all right. That's a good question. So three elements. I mean, yeah. I definitely think that part of it is, you know, this sort of imposter syndrome that so many of us experience at some point. Um, mm -hmm. I experienced that really strongly, especially in undergrad, because I went to this like Ivy League school and I came from, you know, this rural town in New Jersey, which actually has rural towns like on a farm. And my dad was a mechanic and, you know, I just didn't feel necessarily. Oh, really? Oh, that's so funny. Um, what kind of mechanic? <laughs> like a general auto technician, uh, domestic and not domestic. Cool. Yeah. Mine worked on like uh, backhoes and loaders and like equipment, like. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. So we always had this equipment in our house that he would like borrow to dig a hole in the backyard or something. Random um, hole in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it had a purpose. Right. <laughs> um, but um, so anyway, I felt I definitely felt like an imposter for a good period of my life. Um, and then I, you know, I would get feedback that like I was doing better than I thought, you know, that like I got good grades. I clearly belonged there. Um, but I, it just never kind of sunk in. And so that's a big part of, I think, why I was so drawn to this, this idea of underestimating sort of our social competence and our influence. Um, because, you know, I talk about in the book, there's like this long history of over findings about overconfidence where people think they're smarter and more moral and less biased than the average person. And there's so much less on this underconfidence, but it does seem like in the social domain that is becoming a clearer finding. Um, and I, de it definitely resonates with my own personal experience. So if there's one thing that really kind of is me in the book, it's that sense of underconfidence and how, you know, the research has really reassured me that it is not actually being below average in any way. It's underconfidence, it's a bias, right? And that we are actually doing better than we think. Um, right. and then the rest, I mean, it kind of follows. It's like, on the other hand, I'm very analytical and mm -hmm. I don't want to just, you know, I, I want the data. I want to, you know, that's the thing that people could tell me forever. Like, oh no, you know, like, why are you so worried about this? You know, you're fine. You're doing fine, blah, 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 blah. But it's really not until I saw data that's basically backed up this assertion that made me think, okay, this is actually a thing. It's not just, you know, people making me feel better. This is a thing that many of us do, and we are too hard on ourselves. Um, so I'd say those are the two big elements. Uh, and then I, I do, I love writing. So if there's, if I need a third sort of point, I, I like to be creative. I like to write. I like to tell stories. And so I think that that other part is there too. That's a cool one there. I like those first two. They connect importantly because, well, I thought about that when I was reading that this is for this will help a lot of individuals who don't see themselves having so much impact. And then they'll realize, Oh, wait a minute. Actually I did involve uh, influence that person or I got this person to go in that direction, but I didn't realize until two years later, they didn't say anything or uh, something like that. And then the second one of being analytical, it's kind of like, I do that a little bit of like kind of reverse engineering things to figure out, like confirm to myself. Uh, this is the case. I need a base of like concepts. 
And then once you have the concepts in place, oh, okay, this is what's happening right now. In some ways, this is a, it can build some self-esteem from the content. I'm a little bit more specifically on my end, on the other direction. I'll just assume I have the influence of 12, 12 million people, but backtracking is good because I think it's actually more, I tell some individuals it's more relatable, especially now by a huge margin. Um, there's a lot of anxious individuals or uh, not believing in themselves uh, individuals. So any of those individuals, I try to tell them this is the moment to relate on that because you have a huge, I have a minority of people that will relate with me on like, oh, we're just confident and going. There's like four people. But then the others, they would have, they could have a huge following of sorts in that regard. Yeah. And then the other, just to follow up on that, the other part I, I like to sort of point out is that when people are sort of overconfident about their influence, I think it's often about a specific kind of influence. You know, it's like, my ability to like argue with somebody or persuade someone or, you know, and I think that one of the other things that sort of I try to bring out in the book is all these other ways that we still miss our influence, even when we're sort of confident that like I can make a great argument. You don't realize that like, you know, you made this weird face at someone, you said something off and like that really impacted them. Like there's all these kind of other ways that we don't code as influence necessarily that we still can underestimate or miss, you know, the influence that we have. I like this point quite a bit. I have, so in certain categories, I would think, oh, I'm so impactful. And then in things that I thought were irrelevant, or I made a post of some random picture, and then people like, wow, that, that made my day. I'm like, what, what are you referring to? And that wasn't one of my things. That was a main thing. That was a fun bit that I, I didn't even notice at the point. So that is cool. Yeah, we don't really know how we can impact others. We can't see it that clearly. We can't see yeah. it that clearly. But over time, we get feedback. That's why making stuff and reaching out is a nice uh, feature. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in the book, you talk one bit about embarrassment and how, uh, well, a lot of people, they don't do things because they're embarrassed. They avoid it. They don't like that feeling. They probably had it at some point and it was very heavy. Uh, what would you inform the people who have this heavy feeling that comes with, it'll go wrong. Uh, I'll look a certain way. People are thinking of me this way. Yeah, I think there's there's kind of two elements of embarrassment in the book. One is that we're harder on ourselves than we need to be, right? And so there's the classic work by, for example, Tom Gilovich, who's here at Cornell and his colleagues on the spotlight effect, showing basically that when we're embarrassed about something, when we think we've said or done something, you know, super awkward, that other people are not paying as much attention to that as we think they are. So as much as, you know, Erica Boothby stuff is like more people are, are paying attention to you than you think, that's usually about like just everyday kind of stuff. Um, but when you're acutely self-conscious about something, less people are paying attention to that than you think. So it's kind of like this very happy pairing of stories. Um, so on the one hand, you know, those things that we feel really paranoid about and embarrassed about the stupid things like saying something wrong, having something stuck in our teeth, you know, all those things are less of a big deal than we tend to think. Um, but then there's kind of this flip side, that embarrassment as an emotion at the same time is actually more heavy than we think. So the reasons we get embarrassed, you know, we don't need to be so embarrassed about those things. But embarrassment is a serious kind of uh, emotion that we often don't give credit uh, for how serious it can be. Like we think it's this trivial thing that's about having food stuck in your teeth um, or silly things like that. When in fact, you know, it can mean I'm too embarrassed to speak up when someone says something that is kind of racist, right? Or I'm too embarrassed to point out that you said something really inappropriate to me. Um, so there are other situations where we actually think hypothetically, when I'm distanced from that, I think, of course, I would say something if someone said something inappropriate or said something that could be racist, you know, I would stand up and, and make it clear that that was wrong. Um, but in the moment, we often don't because there's ambiguity and we think if we're wrong, it's going to be so embarrassing. Um, and so there's kind of these two elements of embarrassment that it's a really painful emotion that can make us do all sorts of things we'd rather not like just sit there when we know we probably should say something, but it's, you know, less 
of the, the things that we should worry less about are like those silly things that we associate with embarrassment. We should worry more about those other contexts um, where we should be maybe speaking up more. When I have been in a scenario where it would be good to say something, if I don't, then I'm having this weird indirect influence where now, because people look to me to do things. So if I'm not doing anything, now it's likely more people, a lot of people are not doing anything and it starts to feel really heavy. There's a real weight on that. So it's good to, our gut is so powerful. So if we, if we ignore it, it's a huge payment we have to, how important uh, would you attribute our gut uh, to our decision-making? I don't know. I, you know, I think I don't know enough about that specific area of research to really weigh in. I mean, you know, I've read things about, for example, I teach morality at work and we talk about like, you know, emotional gut intuitive reactions to what's wrong and right versus like these rational reactions. And honestly, we have such debates about it that I couldn't even, you know, go into it, but I love, so the point that you made earlier though, about like, if I'm sitting there, I'm kind of conveying to other people that if I'm not going to do anything and I'm not going to say anything, like they're looking to me, they're not going to say anything. I think we often, those are the kinds of things that we forget. So that reminds me of like the bystander intervention studies, right? Where no one's saying anything. And we always think of them from the person who's like looking at everybody else and what they're doing. And when they see no one's doing something, they don't do anything. But we forget that when we're not doing anything, we're those other people in that study. We're the Confederates. Like we're conveying to everybody else that they shouldn't do anything and that whatever's happening is totally normal, you know? Um, and I think we tend to forget of our, our position in those kinds of situations as like part of the people or one of the people who sort of setting the social norm and the interpretation of a situation. Mm -hmm. It is about the interpretation of the situation uh, from their end. And then for the doers, it's more, I can't let this moment go or else uh, I didn't bring my part to it. What is a, uh, a, a category related to influence where people are doing well at this time? Is there anything that's noticeable that in 2021, people are uh, making good use of their influence or recognizing it? So I do think to some extent, um, that people have been asking for things that they didn't used to feel comfortable asking for, um, that there's kind of this understanding because things have been uprooted so much with the pandemic and with people, you know, losing jobs or having to manage kids at home while trying to work and everything, um, that things we would ordinarily doubt ourselves for asking for, we feel more comfortable saying, you know, this is actually what I need to work. This is what I need for my work-life balance, for example. Um, and so I think that people are kind of stepping up and feeling a little more emboldened to ask for things that will make their lives better or allow them to do their work more efficiently, even if it's not sort of the typical way things were done. And my hope uh, is that they're seeing, you know, like in my studies, that people are more willing to work with them and find ways to make them, you know, have that work-life balance or be able to be efficient um than they might have thought previously there's some positives in the current moment hopefully i was recently in a or sometimes i'm in social interactions where uh or i'm invited to things that are not for me and later i was right it wasn't really for me but we take this into account i have a friend who's really good at pinning down what he takes part in what he doesn't take part in i need to basically steal his method because it's really smooth and he doesn't end up throwing away energy the the majority is not exactly like that. The difficulty of turning down things is definitely something that weighs in. And some, a lot of people end up doing things for years that they don't really want to be doing, but they can't put them some sort of hard limiter on it. Um, what can we do about that? Yeah, this is so true. And it's funny because it's really clear to us how hard it is to be rejected, you know, like how hard it is when someone says no to us, that's like really easy to remember and sort of bring to mind. But we forget how hard it is to be the one doing the rejecting and the one who's saying no and like turning down an invitation or an opportunity or whatever it might be. Um, and it's true. People will do things they don't actually want to do potentially even for years, which is so funny, but it's so true. Um, because it's just so hard to say no. 
Um, and so, I mean, I give some suggestions. A lot of my suggestions happen to be mostly around like someone, if someone's kind of asking you for an answer on the spot, which is when I, that's the hardest thing, right? When I tell people how to get things, like how to get a yes, that's what I tell them to do. Like ask someone in person right there. But when I try to tell people how to then avoid saying yes in that moment, it's like get through that situation and then make that decision later. So I usually say if someone's asking you on the spot, tell them you can't decide right now. So you don't have to say no, right? It's just really hard to find the words to say no. And you don't want to hurt, you know, it's so hard to say no because you don't want to damage that reputation. You don't want to insinuate that you're not as close to that person as they might think, or you don't care about them, or, you know, you're a bad person or something. Um, and so you kind of want to find a nice excuse that conveys that none of that is true, but we don't always do that really eloquently in the moment. And so I always say like, buy yourself some time. You don't have to say no, then say, I'll think about it. Send me an email about it. And then you have time to formulate your response. You have that distance. So there's not the same sort of social pressure. Um, and then that's what you convey in your no, is you, you convey, like, I think you're great in some way, you know, and you, in your own kinds of words, like we're good. Don't worry. This isn't about you. It's not about us, but I can't do this for some reason that's external to our relationship or what I think about you. And that's kind of the way to save face for the other person. I thought about this in sort of a reverse context because I looked back and I realized some of the people I had, uh, let's say flirted with years ago and it worked out well, it was in person. I looked back, I'm like, would this have occurred if it was more uh, lighter paced and such? Maybe not. So, so kind of almost, it's cool the, either way that things go, but um, yeah, there's more like weight in the moment and it feels very like the earth is making this thing happen versus it's planned out over time. People, uh, we're usually more logical and think about, okay, what's important to us? Does this fit our values right now? Does this matter at this time? There's more thought to it. So that's good about like separating the, if you want it to be a certain way, maybe go with this context. If you want it to be a certain way, maybe go with this context. It's more thought out. Yeah, that's exactly. Cool. And that's what I like the way I talk about it is not, it's just more, it's not necessarily saying no more or saying yes, no. It's just about being more mindful about the things that you're agreeing to. So you're not doing it because you feel put on the spot, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, in relation to the content of the book, who are some individuals or an individual or entities that have been influential in your research or going into this category? I mean, well, definitely. So Frank Flynn, who was at Columbia when I was a grad student, and now he's at Stanford. So there would be no book without having worked with Frank for years. Um, and so we did so many of my initial studies on how we underestimate sort of the power of asking together. And since then, I'd say, I, you know, I did a postdoc uh, in Toronto and that's where I met Chembo Zhang, who is really into, you know, unethical and moral behaviors. And so that was kind of my initial sort of introduction to those kinds of theories. And so that kind of pushed my work out of necessarily just like pro-social behavior and help seeking, which is really what Frank was mostly focused on and what we had done together um, to other kinds of contexts. It kind of like, I think added a lot of depth to how I was originally thinking about the work uh, where I started thinking, you know, if it's so hard to say no to charitable requests, maybe it's also hard to say no to unethical requests when people are kind of like instigating you to do something you don't really want to do. And that's where I started doing these book vandalism studies where we had participants ask other people to vandalize a library book, like a fake library book, no actual library books to vandalize. <laughs> um, and we found the same effects, right? That even just like when people were asking for pro-social requests or favors, more people said yes than they thought. Even when they asked for unethical things, more people said yes than they thought. Um, and that led me down a path to sort of looking at consent and compliance um, and the difference between the two. And I'd say Rosanna Summers, who is a new assistant professor at Michigan uh, in law. So she and I started working together a few years ago. And I'd say that she's like one of the third people who kind of pushed my research and this kept kind of deepening these kinds of ideas from like, 
here's where it fits into pro-social behavior. Here's where it fits into unethical behavior. Here's where it fits into things like consent. And so we've done studies on like police consent and how a lot of the same dynamics play out there. Um, and then my graduate student, Lauren DaVinci and I did studies on romantic consent and how it plays out there. And so I'd say those three the sorts of people kind of touched this general idea and this research program I'd been working on for a while at different points and just made it such a deeper, more interesting sort of project. That's cool. I always think about the people along the way as they're almost like the key locations we had to visit. There was no other way for us to get to where we are. Yeah. And even though they're just a person, but it's like, that was necessary. Without that, I can't go in that direction. What is one message you would want all people to know from the book to take away for their own being? So I said two, I'm going to do two. <laughs> Unbelievable. This is ridiculous out here. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'd say, first of all, reassurance. So like we talked about, I feel like this research has really reassured me that we don't need to be so hard on ourselves and that we are having impact even when we might feel like we're not. And when we're ineffective, we're actually more effective than we think we are. Um, and then the second piece is mindfulness is that if we do have this influence that we don't recognize that we make sure that we're using it well, that we sort of audit our own behaviors and, and think about how they might be coming across to other people's and when possible, you know, find out from them how we're actually coming across to them and make space for other voices. Um, yeah. So those are probably the two things, reassurance and mindfulness. That's cool. Reassurance and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Dr. Slash Professor. Vanessa, Kimberly, Bones, I would like to thank you for having been on this show, letting us know information related to your book. You have more influence than you think and giving us some life thought. Awesome. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Glad to have you on. And we are out. <laughs> <laughs>